the first Noel.
you may be seated. Wonderful truths of the gospel that are set forth for us in that very beautiful carol. Please take your Bibles and turn with me now, if you will, to our text, which is in the book of Exodus, chapter 3, verses 13 through 15. We read it just a few moments ago. We're looking at the names of God, the fifth part today. We'll be looking at some of those other names in addition to the name Yahweh or Jehovah, also seen as Yah and compounded with several other names that we've not yet looked at. But we want to move on to the name El today and the many compound forms that we find with that particular name. It's a fascinating name of God. That passage in Exodus chapter 3, we saw there are eight different titles that God gives to himself there in that text. And what we've seen is that God also declares his name in multiple other ways as the name Jehovah. He declares that name not only through the written word and the spoken word when he himself spoke it, but we saw that he declared his name through nature, Psalm 8 and Psalm 19. And we saw there were six reasons that are given here in this passage and in several other passages in the Old Testament and New Testament for the study of creation. Number one, the dominion mandate requires the study of creation. Genesis 1, 26 through 28. And this has been a very important theme uh, in Reformation teaching all the way back to the early reformers. The dominion mandate and our responsibility to understand the creation uh, and to subdue it in a way that is pleasing to God. The second was we saw the book of Job commands the study of creation. In Job chapter 12, verses 7 and 8, we are, we are told to speak to the earth and where we are to hear what the birds have to say to us and the fishes of the sea and so forth, uh, that each one of them, it says at the end of that passage, each will teach you. There is something that God wants us to know as we study the creation that relates to his name. We saw the third reason was the New Testament commands a reasoned defense of our faith in 1 Peter 3.15. Number four, we saw the Christ of Scripture, the one in whom we put our faith, is in fact the Creator, John 1, 1 through 14. Number five, and this is very important for us today, in fact I preached a message on Sunday evening three or four weeks ago where I named some names about people who have infiltrated the church and who are teaching a false theory of creation Uh, and very dangerously so, and who are infecting and thus affecting many Christians in the church. But the church has been infiltrated by those who deny special creation in six literal days in the recent past. And the Bible tells us that we are to earnestly contend, that means go to war, we are earnestly to contend for the faith once delivered unto the saints in Jude 3. And it specifically says in Titus chapter 1, verses 9 through 11, that we are to stop the mouths of the gainsayers with their false doctrines which they bring into the church. And number six, we are responsible, of course, for training the next generation in all of these areas, in the dominion mandate, the obedience to the commands to study creation, the obedience to the command to give a reasoned defense of the faith, the command to give an articulate understanding of Christ as the creator, and a zeal to earnestly contend for the faith once delivered unto the saints. We are to pass that on. And Deuteronomy, in two places at least, I'm just picking some at random here, give us that command. Only take heed to thyself and keep thy soul diligently, lest thou forget the things which thine eyes have seen, and lest they depart from thy heart all the days of thy life. But teach them to thy sons and thy sons' sons. And in chapter 6, you're familiar with this passage. It's the passage in which the Shema Yisrael, the Hear, O Israel, is declared. We'll be talking about that when we move to the second name of God. Thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children, and shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house, and when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down, and when thou risest up. This is to be something that is continually communicated to our children as we teach them about who God is and what he's done and how God has revealed himself in his name and how God has revealed himself in these other ways. 
The second way that we saw the name of God declared was God unveiling himself to and through his people. And there were two principles that we learned under that. Number one, walking in the fear of the Lord declares the name of God to unbelievers. And secondly, being a witness to God's name requires us to witness to the heathen, the pagan unbelievers who are all around us. If you are failing to walk in the fear of the Lord, that is, in obedience to the commands of Scripture, you are bringing blasphemy to his name. If you are failing to be the witness to the heathen that God requires you to be because he declares his name through you to the heathen, then you are failing to obey what God has commanded you to do. The third way we saw that God declared his name was in his mighty presence in judgment. In Psalm 75, we read to the chief musician, al a psalm or song of Asaph, Unto thee, O God, do we give thanks. Unto, we, unto thee do we give thanks, for that thy name is near, thy wondrous works declare. When I shall receive the congregation, I will judge uprightly. The earth and all the inhabitants thereof are dissolved. I bear up the pillars of it. Several scientific statements we noted in those passages there, uh, statements that deal with the second coming of Christ and the dissolution of the atomic structure of the earth, as Peter tells us, and also the fact that God is the one who bears up the pillars of the earth. He hangs it upon nothing, as the book of Job declares for us. One of the clearest illustrations of God's judgment, and indeed this is something else that is defended and demonstrated to the pagan unbelievers, is Peter's declaration concerning the worldwide flood of Noah. That's seen in the study of geology. In it, Peter states that the name of God is declared in judgment, and he gives multiple scientific references to creation and the flood of Noah. Knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers, walking after their own lusts. That's what we see around us. And saying, where is the promise of his coming? They deny the return of Christ because... Their mouths have not been stopped concerning God's former judgments. For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation, uniformitarianism. Peter tells us that it's going to happen. He told us that 2,000 years ago. Those who believe in long ages of the earth, those who believe in, in the cyclical types of things, as in Hindu uh, theology, Peter tells us God sent us a warning, a shot across the bow to remind us that he's the God who declares his name through judgment. For this they are willingly ignorant of, that by the word of God the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of the water and in the water, now here it is, whereby the world that then was being overflowed with water perished. Did you know that that's what Peter gives as proof for the return of Christ and the judgment of this world by fire? That's the way he introduces his warning about the coming judgment. Listen to this. Here is the declaration of God's holy name through future judgment. But the heavens and the earth which are now, by the same word, are kept in store, reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. That's verse 7, right after that last verse 6, which I just read about the flood of Noah. But, beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. He's making reference to the day of the Lord, which is a thousand-year period which will happen upon this earth as promised in the Scripture in what we call the millennium. The Lord is not slack concerning his promises, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to us word, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Why has not God sent his judgment? Why has he delayed his judgment? The unbelievers, the scoffers say, well, you know, where's the promise of his coming? Peter tells us the answer to that. Oh, God still has those of his elect who have not yet been saved. God is still tolerating the wickedness of this sinful world because there are those whom he will irresistibly draw to Christ. And he uses us as his witnesses who declare his name among the heathen to do so. We pray for the soon return of our Lord Jesus Christ. 
How we wish it were this day. I think all of us would, with eagerness, welcome the moment that Christ calls us up to be with himself. But dear friends, what did Jesus, who portrays himself as the king in the parable, say to his servants when he went into the far country? Occupy till I come, and he had given to each one of them certain talents and responsibilities, which they were to exercise and multiply till he came back. When he comes back, he will judge his enemies, all those who would not have him rule over them. When he had received the kingdom for himself, he says, bring my enemies to me and slay them. Judgment is coming, but the servants are supposed to be occupying until he comes. Listen to what else Peter says here. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to us word, not willing that any should perish but that all should come to repentance. That's modified by that to us word. He's long-suffering to you and me, to those who are his children, to those who are his elect in that verse. But the day of the Lord will come. That's that day he was talking about just two verses earlier. We don't have to make it up and make the one day into a thousand years and the thousand years into long periods of indeterminable time. That's the day-age theory, and that's all these people who believe that God doesn't really tell us what he wants to tell us in his word. He tells you here he's talking about the day of the Lord, and two verses later, the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. And we pointed out last week, the two times here in these verses, that word is the word from which we get our English word, Adam. Peter is talking about the dissolution of Adam's. 2,000 years ago. It's only in the 1900s that men learned how to dissolve the atom and to split it in half, and what has produced this immense heat, this gigantic noise. God, of course, put the atom together. He knew what would happen when you dissolve it. When men split the atom, that's what we find. And here it is, written in Second Peter. The elements shall melt with fervent heat, and the earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up, seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved. This is the judgment. God declaring his name through judgment. What manner of persons ought ye to be in all holy conversation and godliness, looking for and hasting, oh, we're pressing toward it, we're looking forward with eagerness to it, to the coming day of God wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. Peter says, if you understand that, if you believe that, that will motivate you to live a holy life. Seeing then that all these things be dissolved, what manner of persons ought ye to be in all holy conversation and godliness? We have a God who is a judge. Jesus Christ is the judge. He says, the Father hath committed all judgment unto the Son, John chapter 5. If you believe that Jesus Christ is who he said he is, that he is the creator, that he is the sustainer, that he is the judge, it will motivate you to holy living. Oh, God's people should be a pure people. God's people should be a holy people. God's people should be a reverent people. God's people should be an obedient people. In summary, the name of God declared in judgment. But God is the judge. He putteth down one and setteth up another. Pour out thy wrath upon the heathen that have not known thee and upon the kingdoms that have not called upon thy name. So the heathen shall fear the name of the Lord and all the kings of the earth thy glory. You and I must declare it to them. That's where God has put us into the picture. But we don't like the friction that it produces. We don't like the pressure that we come under when we do that. But God has made us his witnesses to declare his name among the heathen. Fourth, God defends his own name to prevent blasphemy. We saw that illustration with Sennacherib and Rashaka in Isaiah chapter 37, where the, uh, the Assyrians came against the city of Jerusalem and Rav Shaka, the general of Sennacherib, the king of Assyria, 
cursed and blasphemed the name of God. And so God, to defend his own name, went out and slew 180,000 Assyrians in one night. But sometimes the name of God is blasphemed by us and through us. Thou that makest thy boast of the law, Paul says in Romans 2, through breaking the law dishonorest thou God, for the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles through you as it is written. He's writing that to Christians. He's writing that to a strong church a doctrinally sound church. He's writing that to the church at Rome where we have all of our magnificent doctrines concerning the sovereignty of God. And he says, even there at Rome, there are some of you, because of the way that you're living, they're causing the name of God to be blasphemed among the heathen. We gave you illustrations in Timothy, Titus, and James for that that perhaps the name of God is being blasphemed through the way you live. Now today, we continue on in our study of the name of Christ in the New Testament, where it parallels the name of Jehovah in the Old Testament. In the New Testament, the expression, the name of Christ, or the name of Jesus, refers to all that Jesus is, both as revealed by the prophets of the Old Testament and as he is now, and as he ever will be. Then opened he their understanding, that they might understand the scriptures, and said unto them, Thus it is written, and thus it behooved Christ, to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day. Now listen to verse 47. This is Luke 24. And that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations. Repentance and remission of sins preached in the name of Christ. There's no salvation in any other name. You can't name another name under heaven, the scripture tells us, whereby we must be saved. It's only at the name of Jesus. It is the name of Jesus, that is who he really is as the sovereign God, that motivates us to suffer. Did you know that? Why are we pressing so hard on the name of God and how it relates to the name of Jesus? Because it is only the name of Christ. When you do come to that pressure point that we spoke of a moment ago, when you have to interface with the world where you are declaring the name of God among the heathen, where they are rejecting you and mocking you and scorning you, where you must give a reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. It's at that pressure point where you suffer persecution that you must understand the name of Christ because that is what will give you the strength to go through suffering. Listen to this. In Acts chapter 9, verse 13, Ananias is arguing with the Lord about going to find Saul who has been smitten blind on the road to Damascus. And God has told him, look, I want you to go down there and talk to this guy. And he says, Lord, I've heard about this guy. He's a bad dude. I mean, he's putting people in jail. He's killing people. Uh, anybody who, who's a Christian, he's, uh, he's really putting a lot of pressure on them. And Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard by many of this man how much evil he hath done to thy saints at Jerusalem. And here he hath authority from the chief priests... Now listen to this next phrase. To bind all that call on thy name. Dear friends, Christians all over the world through the last 2,000 years, those who have called on the name of Jesus have suffered imprisonment and torture and death. And here is Ananias complaining and saying, Lord, I really don't want to come in contact with this guy because it might get me in trouble. He understood what it meant to call on the name of the Lord and what it might cost. Listen to how the Lord answers him and in relation to the name. But the Lord said unto him, Go thy way, for he is a chosen vessel. Let me pause there for a moment. If you're a Christian, you are also a chosen vessel. 
It doesn't say you're a chosen nut or screw or bolt or, you know, flange or tire. It says you're a chosen vessel. What do vessels do? They carry something. A vessel is something that is designed not for its own sake, but so that it might have something inside it that is of value to the owner of the vessel. So that the owner of the vessel can transport whatever that valuable thing is in the context of the vessel. You are a vessel. God has put something inside of you. God expects you to be faithful in transporting what he has put in you for a specific purpose of the master. Listen to the rest of the verse. Paul was a chosen vessel to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. If you are a Christian, you have been chosen to bear the name of Jesus. You have been chosen to be the vessel that exudes the fragrance and loveliness of Jesus. But you say, well, how does that have to do with suffering? Well, let me read you the next verse. For I will show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. Friends, there's a cost to Christianity. Oh, not for salvation. But there is a cost to the flesh. There is a cost to our placebo type of attitude whereby we think, well, we're not really doing much in the world. We're just a placebo here. No, God has put the name of Christ in you and on you to bear it to the nations and there will be pressure and there will be opposition and there will be suffering for his namesake. But we don't like that because we much prefer our own personal peace and affluence and our sloth and our lackadaisical attitude toward things spiritual. The cost, friends, is where God is burning the dross out of our lives, the waste products out of our lives, the things that long for this world instead of that long for heaven, the things that are busy pacifying all those around us instead of glorifying God. I will show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. Do you bear the name of Christ? Has he filled you with his spirit? Is it the aroma of Christ that people sense in you when they come in contact with you? Or is it merely another ho-hum worldly Christian? Third, the name of Jesus expresses the great truth that only he can give us eternal life and salvation. John 1 verses 11 through 13. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. Very interesting, those words there, one in the masculine, one in the neuter. He came unto his own things, and his own ones received him not. Interesting. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe, you can all say it with me, on his name. You see, when we talk about the name of Jesus, we are talking about everything that he is, who he really is, and it is a name that declares who he is and what he's done, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. It is God who willed our new birth, as he explains in chapter 3. John chapter 20, and many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written that ye might believe that Jesus is the Christ, that is the Messiah, the Son of God, last phrase, 
and that believing he might have life through his name. I hope that from this point forward, every time you read a passage of scripture and the name of Jesus or through his name or at the name of Jesus or the name of God or God says my name is, every time you run across that word name, you begin to realize the thousands and thousands of times in scripture that God is pointing to his character through his name. How much we can learn about God just by looking at his name. We find in Acts 4, this is the stone which was set at naught of you builders, which has become the head of the corner. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men, whereby we must be saved. Dear friends, it's the name of Jesus. Jesus is the creator. Jesus is the sustainer. Jesus is the redeemer. There is no salvation outside of his name. It is our Lord Jesus Christ. The name of Jesus declares his healing power. Acts 4.10, Be ye known unto all of you and to all the people of Israel, that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom ye crucified, God hath raised up from the dead, even by him doth this man stand before you whole. It's the name of Jesus declaring his healing power. Naming the name of Christ means to acknowledge who he is. It means that you will explain and understand how he has transformed you. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 19. Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure, having this seal. Now God has a foundation. Other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. And there are things on that foundation. We build on that foundation. What is the seal? The foundation of God standeth sure, having this seal. The Lord knoweth them that are his. So there you have the sovereignty of God over on one side. Here's the foundation. Our Lord Jesus Christ. We find the sovereignty of God. What do we find on the other side? Listen to the second half of the verse. And let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. How do you prove to the world around that you belong to Christ? God can see the invisible. God controls the invisible. God gives certain foundation to the invisible. God is the one who in eternity past did the choosing. How is the world around you going to know it? There's an and in the middle of that sentence. And let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. There are many who name the name of Christ but are involved in all kinds of iniquity. Interesting word, word that deals with moral sin. Everyone that names the name of Christ. Do you name the name of Christ? Do you claim that his seal is upon you? Do you claim that you've trusted in him alone for salvation? Then you have a responsibility. Let everyone that names the name of Christ because you are his witnesses, depart from iniquity. The next name that we find in our text is the name God, capital G, little O-D. That's the name Elohim. That name of God occurs 2,700 times in the Old Testament. Exactly. Interesting. 2,700 times in the Old Testament. As someone has pointed out, that's a rather interesting multiple of three times three times three times a thousand. Three threes. Giving us a picture of the Trinity. I know I'm not into numerology and stuff, but I think it's interesting. Three times three times three is 27 times a thousand. 2,700 times it occurs in the Old Testament. That the first time that that name occurs is in Genesis chapter 1. 
which takes us back to the creation narrative. Now that is fascinating. The creation narrative. In the beginning, God, that's Elohim, created the heavens and the earth. And the earth was out form and void, and darkness covered the face of the deep. Elohim is a rather interesting word in and of itself because it is a plural form. There are not more than one God. The scriptures make that very clear. There is one and only one God. And yet the first name for God used in the Old Testament is a plural form. When you see a word in the Old Testament, especially those that deal with entities or with individuals with an I am on the ending, it's a plural form. We put an S on the end like dogs and cats and so on. But in Hebrew, they put an I am, like there's a cherub, there are cherubim, I am. There's a seraph, there are seraphim, I am. That's plural. The first name for God that occurs in the Bible is in the plural form. I think that is the very first indicator that we have the Trinity involved in the Old Testament. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was without form and void. And darkness covered the face of the depths. And the Spirit of God moved across the face of the waters. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. Verses 1, 2, and 3 are cited for us in John chapter 1. And we find there the Lord Jesus Christ involved. We find in verse 2, we find the Holy Spirit of God involved. Later on, we find the Father involved in creation. All three members of the Godhead are involved in that name, Elohim. We find the singular form of Elohim is El. And throughout Scripture, hundreds of times we find the name El, which is God. One of the places we find the name El is in Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. The Mighty God is El Gibor, God the Mighty One. I can share with you some interesting Thoughts I see I don't have time. Our time has run out. Maybe I'll share this next week. An opportunity I had to witness to two Jewish men um, on that very text and on that Hebrew name. I was working as an announcer at a radio station, a very powerful classical radio station in Dallas, Texas, to pay my way through seminary. And I worked every night from 6 p.m. till 2 o'clock in the morning. And then I'd work a 12-hour shift on Saturday. And one night, one of the uh, announcers had two Jewish friends who were visiting him down there at the station. And I had just gotten back from Israel at that point. And uh, he called me over and he says, uh, Christian, these uh, fellas have some questions uh, that they'd like to ask you because I know that you believe that Jesus is God. And where our discussion led that evening was to Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. And they said, well, that passage you're quoting there, mighty God, just means uh, a hero of God. I said, no, this is a construct state. It's very clear that the one who is going to be born, the one whose government is going to go forth, the one of whose kingdom there is not going to be any end in verse 10, that's clearly a human being, and you have yourselves admitted in our former conversation that this is a messianic passage. And so this brings you to the conclusion, because of the structure of the Hebrew text, that this one is also the mighty God. It's a name that deals with his infinite power, with his omnipotence. And they did not know what to say. Oh, I have a lot of stories I'd like to share with you, but our time is up for today. The Lord willing, we'll pick up with Elohim, El, El Gibor, Eloah, 
all the many forms of El that we find in the Old Testament that declare different parts of the character and nature of God. Gracious Heavenly Father, how we thank you for the delightful privilege it is to know you. The study of your names reveals who you are. And if we are believers, it should be an infinite joy and delight to learn more about you. To earnestly desire with all of our heart to know you better, not just to generally know that you're there and we're saved, but to know you, the living God. Oh, how we desire that, Father. Help us as we study your word to have that thirst quenched as we learn more about you and learn who you are, the one whom we worship and adore and will for all of eternity. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.